is so freaking, I'm up next. My topic is so freaking complex that if we don't have slides, I'll, I'll start talking about something else. Okay, this is, like I've kind of said, this is complex, but this is awesome. All right, this is how do you legally raise an unlimited amount of investor money from an unlimited number of investors in the United States without having the SEC kill you, okay? I'll say that again. How do you raise an unlimited amount of money for your blockchain venture from an unlimited number of investors in the United States without the SEC throwing you in jail, suing you, all that other fun stuff? This is the way to go. Assuming I can get a clicker to work. Okay, there you go. Now, there's some very modern movies or French New Wave movies where the first scene in the movie is the last scene. They show you the conclusion at the beginning, and then the whole movie is showing you how you got there. Well, you can think of this presentation as sort of a French New Wave movie. I'm going to show you the last slide in the presentation now. Here's the bottom lines. There's do's and don'ts. And like that French movie, this will not make much sense now, but I promise by the time we're done, this will make great sense and you'll use this. So do use Reg D. Reg stands for regulation. Do use Reg D, specifically Rule 506C, to conduct what's called a private placement, not a public offering, but a private placement of securities and raise unlimited capital from an unlimited number of what's called accredited investors. Do do this. Do verify, verify that these investors are actually accredited. Do not take their word for it. Do not, don't, mess around with unaccredited investors. And don't mess around with what's referred to as bad actors. So, and I don't mean Arnold Schwarzenegger at the beginning of his career. I mean legally bad actors. She's pretty good now. Uh, do not make any representations of what's called material facts or omit material facts when offering or selling securities. These are the bottom lines, do's and don'ts. These are the keys to the kingdom. Okay, now let's take a big picture look at what do I mean when I say selling securities? What do I mean when I say raising capital? Well, this is sort of an update of a traditional economic model. People create platforms, they create enterprises, they go into business because they have an idea for something that will create more value than they, what they put into it. It's like this, taking the ingredients for a pie, adding your skill, your labor, your work, and out comes an actual pie. Right, the ingredients through your work and processes and labor becomes something more valuable. And you can take that value that you add and that becomes a profit. That's how wealth is created. Hey, wealth doesn't just land from the sky. It's the result of an enterprise, some activity. But not every enterprise is successful. Obviously, many fail. We're seeing some ICOs fail. So within every enterprise opportunity is also risk, the chance that things might not work out. So what are the ingredients for this pie? What goes into a business or a platform or enterprise to make things work? Well, on a fundamental level, you need an entrepreneur. You need someone with an idea, with a vision, and people who also share that vision to come up with an idea in the first place and begin to lead or manage or inspire people to do something. So you need the idea, and you can't underestimate the idea and the visionary. That's like Steve Jobs. You need actual, actual work done. Now, in the old days, that was through people's muscle. But there's also automation, processes in general, or just work in general. You need activity. Ideas by themselves aren't enough. Work by itself isn't enough. You need ideas plus ideas. Plus, you, you usually need to add some sort of productive asset. Productive assets used to be typically land, buildings, physical machinery. Uh, Robots are still our form of productive asset. They don't have, productive assets don't need to be physical. They can be ideas also. They can be intellectual property, a patent, 
a trademark, a, bit, a trade secret, a way of doing things, a chemical process. That's not physical, but it is an asset. Now, the one I didn't mention yet, and probably equally important to the idea, if not more important, is the secret sauce is capital. Capital is usually money, but it doesn't have to be money. There's many forms of capital. You, these factors by themselves will only get you so far. You need almost all the time, especially if you're going big, to get capital, to get investment. So where do you get that investment? If you have an enterprise opportunity that's risky, where do you get that capital? Well, you can get it from the people who are participating in the business, but they only usually have so much. You need to go to other people who are not actively involved in the business. You go to you know, funds, investors, your mom, people who are not actively involved in the business, and you have to ask them for money. And if they love you, they'll give it to you. But if they don't love you, they'll, they'll give it to you but want something back, okay? Usually the thing that they want back is a share of the profits of the business. Right? That's what makes this thing into an investment. They want something back. They want to get back more than they put in. So what are the different forms of this? What does this look like? All right, now if you're in the, block, if you're in the traditional world, yeah, if you're in the traditional world, there, there's sort of two ways of, well, let, let, me take, well, let me take another step back. The traditional world, when you invest, you're either investing directly in the company, which is called equity. Okay, you're getting either stocks or shares. So that's equity. Or you're lending money to the company. That's debt. Equity and debt. That's the two traditional modes of investment. Equity, you're getting a share of the company. So if a company gets sold or gives out dividends, you make money that way. Debt is a little bit different. And Pavel was alluding to these new kinds of notes called revenue um, participation notes. But what debt means is I'm lending you a certain amount of a certain amount of money. At some point in the future, I want that money back, and I also want interest paid on what I lent you. Okay, interest is basically rent payments on money. Okay, if you want to understand interest, it's basically the rent you pay for borrowing money. So you can either investors either put in uh, money for equity or they put in money for debt. Investors put in capital in one of those two firms forms into the enterprise. If they want to share in the profits, typically they will buy sh uh, stock or they want to get interest payments, they will buy bonds or debt. Under this new interesting blockchain model, it's a little bit different. People don't necessarily own the underlying company. They don't necessarily lend money to the underlying company. What they do is they buy tokens or the right to receive tokens at a big discount in the hopes that the tokens will go up in value over time and then they can sell them on the open market to others inve other investors or on an exchange for more money. Okay, that's what a lot of people in this room, this is your world. You're not necessarily selling equity, you're not selling debt, you're selling tokens. Now, you know, normally when I ask questions in Ukraine, I gotta be honest, people don't respond, they don't raise their hands. Don't be them, let's all, be, uh, help me out here. Who's heard of a SAFT, S-A-F-T? All right, arms are going up, great. The, the easiest way, the simplest way to do this model where you're starting up a business and you sell tokens to people to get the money to build a platform, well, that's theoretically easy. You just sell the tokens to people, you take their money, you build the platform, and the, then the tokens become worth more. What well, could be simpler? The problem is that's usually illegal because if your tokens are gonna end up being not securities at some point, for example, they're gonna be utility tokens, the, the view around the world is until the tokens become functional, they're gonna be treated like securities, and securities are highly regulated. Right? So it's generally, a lot of companies got nailed for this, it's generally a bad idea to sell your tokens to the world as tokens before they're functional. Okay, that's going to be an unregistered sale, public sale of securities. Okay, that's a no-no. What people are doing to deal with that problem is they're, something, they're selling something called a SAFT. SAFT stands for Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. It's a paper investment. And, what you're, and you're selling that SAFT to a limited number of investors, 
those investors cannot transfer the SAF generally. You take the money that you receive from selling that SAF, you build your platform, and then when the platform is ready and the tokens are functional, you can convert that SAF into tokens that are not securities. Right? Uh, I give long presentations on SAFs, but, but the, the bottom line is that in the old days, people would buy stock in a company or lend a company money as investors. In the more modern era, when you're working with blockchain companies, companies are not selling those things, they're selling SAFs, okay? But, both, but regardless, both of these things are securities. They're regulated like securities, okay? So, now, again, you're gonna have a three-hour lecture or, or presentation on what the heck a security is. This is the reasonably short version. What is a security anyways? What do we mean when we say security? A security is the legal interest, legal interest. Remember I said a contract is a legally enforceable agreement? Okay, a security is a legally enforceable interest. It's not a pretty please, but it's something that the court or the law will make sure works. It's the legal interest which an investor receives in exchange, in exchange for contributing capital, and whether that capital is money, usually, or something else of value, to an enterprise in the hopes of realizing a profit or, or other economic benefit, here's the key, resulting from the enterprise's success, but where such outcome is not guaranteed and the invested capital is at risk of being reduced or lost. So if there's a business that sells cars, a car manufacturer, and I use my money to buy the car from the manufacturer, and I drive the car, I am not investing in the car manufacturer. If I buy a Toyota, and I get the car, and Toyota makes twice the profits the next year, I don't get to share in those profits. I'm just buying a car, okay? I'm a consumer, not an investor. What an investor does is actually gives money to the company not to buy a car that the company makes, but because they want to share in the economic success of that company. Okay, that's the difference between a consumer and an investor. So when you, do, you know, if I buy a car, I don't get the upside of the car company doing well, but I don't suffer usually if the company goes bankrupt or loses money. When you're investing, you're taking risk alongside with the company you're investing in. If the company does well, then what you're investing in should go up in value. If the company does poorly, what you're investing in will probably go down in, in value. Okay, it's that element of risk and economic speculation that makes a, a security a security. So the short version of the short version is a security is an investment contract. Okay, now, selling investment contracts, selling securities is regulated. It's subject to restrictions everywhere on the planet. Okay, I mean, I haven't checked Afghanistan, but I'm pretty sure, right? You cannot sell securities to everyone and just do it, right? It's highly regulated everywhere. It's especially highly, it's very highly regulated in countries where the money is, okay? Because that's where people, that's where it has to be highly, you know, subject to a lot of regulation. So large economies, the US, China, Europe, they have a huge amount of regulation because that's where the money is. That's where people are trying to take advantage of selling securities. And in the United States, securities regulation has the reputation for being especially complex and punitive. And punitive means punishing, okay? So the reputation in the US is that, complex, that regulation is complex and punishing. And our agency that governs or administers the law the Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC, has a reputation for being very aggressive. Okay, so why bother with the US? I'm gonna do the short version of this, which is that's where the money is. People want to invest, and they do invest. And I've worked on many, many deals where people will invest in blockchain startups. And yes, the default rules, which we'll go over, are complex and scary, they are. But there are so many exemptions or exceptions from those default rules like the one I'm gonna talk about, where you can just go, ha ha, I don't have to follow those default rules, I'll follow the exception, and it's much less difficult than in many other countries. And you can raise it as much capital as you need if you have a good product. 
All right, now, this is the core of, US, of the US legal system. And by the way, I want to throw out there that if you add me on LinkedIn and send me a message, I w I'm more than happy to share this deck with you. So you're welcome to take pictures, um, but I'm, I'll also email you the deck. I'm happy to do it. All right, so here's the core of US securities law. Within these five statutes, there's two that really, really matter, and they form the basis. There's the Securities Act of 1933, which was the first national law on securities, and that was quickly followed by the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Securities Act of 1933, which I'm going to be talking about during this presentation, but equally, if not more important for other reasons, is the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. And then there's three related laws. Okay, let's talk about the 33 Act. It has two points, and they're both put into the preamble, the, int the introductory statement of the Act. The first point of the 33 Act is to provide for the full disclosure of the character of the securities being sold, and the second point is to prevent or punish fraud that's done in the connection with the sale of securities. But the main, main, main point is that 33 Act is trying to make sure that the company that sells securities is providing adequate information about those securities so that people can make good decisions. Now, let's learn some terminology or legal English because this, these words live throughout all the, the written material on securities. When a company or a platform, whether it's a blockchain token being sold or selling equity or whatever, the company selling something that's a security, selling its own interests to someone else, the very first person who buys them, the company that's selling is referred to as the issuer. Okay? An issuer is someone or a company, a platform, whatever, who's selling its own securities to an investor. That first sale, when a company is trying to raise capital and selling its own securities, its own tokens, is called a distribution. An issuer engages in a distribution of its securities. When an investor buy those, buys those securities or buys those tokens and sells them to another investor, okay, that's not an issue, that's trading. Okay? Distribution is first sale. Sales on exchange over to the counter or person to person, that's trading. Right? The Securities Act, the 33 Act, is only concerned with the initial or primary distribution of securities. In other words, to take a blockchain example, your platform is selling tokens or selling SAFs in order to build the platform, that's underneath the 33 Act. The stuff that comes later, the trading, the exchanges, is under the 34 Act. Okay, the 33 Act defines security. This is a lot of stuff, oh my gosh. But the general idea is that if you're selling pre-functional tokens, tokens that you're selling now and using the money to build your platform, the worldwide agreement or consensus or opinion is that those tokens legally count as what's known as an investment contract and therefore will be treated as securities. Now there's, if you're in this industry, you probably heard about the Howey case or the Howey test. Does that ring a bell, Howey test? Okay, good. The, I'm not gonna beat it to death here, but the Howey test is about when you sell something that does not go by a traditional securities name, it's not called a stock, it's not called a bond, it's not called a note, but it acts like a security. Is it a security or is it not a security? I mean, if I sell my security that's really a stock, but I call it a chair, okay, does that mean the SEC goes, oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. That thing you're selling that's exactly like a stock, but you called it a chair, we're not gonna stop you from selling that because it's a chair, it's not a stock. Okay, obviously, that doesn't work. Every regulator on the planet looks at the legal and economic characteristics of what you're selling and decides on its own applying certain factors to whether or not that thing is or is not a, a security. Sometimes people are not trying to be clever. Sometimes they're not misnaming something uh, intentionally. Sometimes new forms of investment appear. For example, tokens. Okay, back in 1933, when the Congress wrote this law, 
there weren't tokens except maybe subway tokens. Okay? They couldn't have listed token under the definition of security. But there's this concept of investment contract, which is sort of a general category. And if something is an investment contract, just in very broad terms, it will be considered a security. And the Howey case, the Howey test, lets you know whether or not that is true. OK, here's the part that freaks people out. The default rule under the 33 Act, the default rule that applies to issuers is that it is unlawful, meaning even sometimes criminal, sometimes, it is unlawful to sell, offer to sell, or deliver securities unless two things are true. There's something called a registration statement in effect, which means the SEC has approved it. It's a big form that you file with SEC, a registration statement. And also a prospectus, i.e. a sales document, has been approved by the SEC. So again, under Section 5 of the Act, it is illegal to sell securities in the United States unless the SEC has approved a registration statement and a sales document, i.e. your prospectus. That takes months. It costs millions of dollars. It's a hassle. Okay, if you're Google or Apple or whatever, then go for it. No one, it's very unlikely that anyone in this room really actually wants to do that. Okay, that is a mess. And you, if you do that, you want to do that intentionally. But, there's, if you, but that is the default rule. That's the rule you have to comply with unless you find an exception. And by the way, when you do this, when you file and get approval for a registration statement and a prospectus and then sell your stock to everyone, that's called going public. It's initial public offering, IPO. Okay? Most of the time, you don't want to do that. You want to do what's called a private sale, a private placement. But that's the default rule. OK, let's keep going here. Now, thank God Section 3 has a class of securities that are securities. There's no question they're securities. But the Congress, the government of the United States said, even though these are securities, we're not going to make you <laughs> I got to go for 10 more minutes. We're not going to make you register them with the SEC because there's no point. So, for example, when the U.S. government sells its own bonds, you know, the, when, the, when the U.S. government wants even more debt, oh, God, you know, and it wants to have, suppose the U.S. government wants to take on another trillion dollars of debt and it sells its bonds. Okay? It does not need to register its bond sale with the SEC because the SEC has nothing to say about it. It's the U.S. government. Okay. If you have a class of securities that's sold entirely within a single state, for example, entirely within California, the SEC doesn't get involved. Right? Or if you sell, or if a nonprofit is selling tokens or securities and it's legitimate, then the SEC doesn't get involved. That's section three. Section four is what everyone in this room should focus on. There's exempted securities, but then there's exempted transactions. In other words, the, thing, the things you're selling are securities. They are securities. They're not the kind of securities that the SEC doesn't care about. The SEC does care about them. But despite this, if you follow certain rules, even though these are regulated securities, you do not need to register them under Section 5. You don't need to register them. You don't need to have a prospectus. You can get away from that default rule. Now, there's a whole bunch of exempted transactions, but the one that really, really, really matters is Section 4A2. It's a transaction by an issuer. In other words, the first sales stock from a company, not what happens later, that does not involve any public offering. Okay? So in other words, if you're selling your securities privately in a smaller scale and not offering them to the general public, you, under 4A2, do not need to register your securities with the SEC. Wait a second, I don't need to register my SEC. Here, to use legal English, that's awesome. Okay, if you don't have to register your securities with the SEC simply by not avoiding a public offering, that's great. Okay? Now, of course, what does that mean? What's the difference between a private offering and a public offering? I mean, if I sell just to you, you awesome timer enforcer, just you, and we're, we've known each other 20 years, okay, and you know my business, right? That's clearly a private sale. If I sell to everyone in this room, who I just kind of am meeting right now, and I go, Your Honor, it wasn't a public sale, it was only the people at this conference, 
Okay, that's not going to work, obviously. I mean, so there's a dividing line somewhere between a private placement and a public sale. Now, thank God that's a lot clearer now, but it's worth thinking about what the courts did until it became a lot clearer. They would look at all these factors to try to tell whether or not something was a public sale or a private sale. There's many parts of this, but the core thing was, is, was it a confidential offering where things were not advertised to the public, but just to certain people? Were these people sophisticated investors? Did they have adequate information to make a decision? And were they looking to buy what they were buying as an investment and not something that they were gonna quickly resell? These are the factors that the courts looked at to see under 4A2 whether or not something was a public offering or a private placement. Is it this list? And again, I'm, I'm happy to provide this deck. You don't have to memorize this or take pictures. Now, this is what everyone in this room wants to use if you're raising money from US investors. You want to use Regulation D, Reg D. Okay? Tattoo in your brain, Reg D. Okay? Reg D is a cluster of rules, and they're now numbered 501 through 508. It's been expanded. But the first rules came out in 1982. And what Reg D does is it says, look, the SEC says, we're not sure what's a public offering. We're not sure what's a private placement. But if you follow these rules, no matter what, we'll treat it as a private placement and you're safe. So 4A2 is a little vague. Reg D is not vague. You follow these rules, you're safe. So follow these rules, okay? And the technical language is Reg D ensures that when you follow it, you're exempted from registration under Section 5. So that awesome thing, that awesome thing right there, you can be sure that you're awesome. All right, now, Reg D was pretty good even in 1982, but in 2012 slash 2013, it became amazing due to a change in Rule 506. Remember, Reg D is Rules 501 through 508. Specifically, there's a new 506C. Bob, okay. Now, just 506 in general. You're not exempted under section, sorry, you're exempted from section five. You can raise an unlimited number of, amount of money for an unlimited number of investors. You have to file a form with the SEC. You cannot do business with certain people. They're called bad actors. And the stock that you sell is gonna be restricted, meaning that people can't quickly resell it. There's two variants of 506. There's 506B and 506C. And I'm going fast just for time, but you'll get the headlines. Now, common to both ideas is that you generally want to focus on accredited investors. What's an accredited investor? The real short version is an accredited, accredited investor has money or enough money that we can safely assume that this person, even if they're an idiot, can hire someone who's not an idiot to look over the proposed investment and decide whether or not it's a good idea. Okay, how do we know whether someone has enough money that they can hire someone who has a brain? They have annual income over 200,000 for the past two years and we'll probably get that the next year. Okay, we assume they have a brain. They have net worth over one million, either jointly with it or with their spouse. Okay, we assume they have a brain. There's another interesting one, which is investor is a general partner, officer, or director of the issuer. In other words, they're leading the company that's selling the stock. Well, they may not have money, but if they're at that level inside the company, they probably have adequate information. Brokers and dealers, which is our defined terms, are automatically accredited investors. People who don't fit one of these categories aren't an accredited investor. They're called an unaccredited investor. Here's a quick version of the form that you need to file with the government when you do a Reg D. Notice that it's a notice of exempt securities. You're just letting the SEC know. You're not asking for their approval. You're not saying yes, please. You just file this form. Okay, it's called a Form D. And by the way, if you, it's three pages long or four pages long. And I, what I always say is, someone who can't figure out how to figure out how to fill out a Form D should not be selling securities in the first place. Okay, you, you can, you, believe me, you can do it. Okay, I'm gonna go quickly through this part. If you're taking advantage of Reg D, if you're taking advantage of Rule 506, you gotta be really careful that the people you're working with when you do that aren't bad people. They haven't been convicted of a crime relating to securities. They're not subject 
to some order from the SEC. Okay? They're not, they don't have anything bad in their background. You need to check. And again, you're welcome to get the deck from me. So there's the idea of a covered person. You don't need to check that for everyone. You don't need to check that for your janitors or your secretaries or whoever. You need to check whether certain people, covered people, are what's called bad actors. So there's a list of people who are covered people. And then there's a list of actions that will disqualify these people and make them bad actors. All right. Now, what's, so for example, here's an obvious one. If someone who's a covered person, say the president of your company, has had a conviction, a, a criminal conviction, for a crime relating to the purchase or sale of securities or making a false filing with SEC. So if someone was convicted of securities fraud and they're the president of your company, they're going to be a bad actor. And if you have a bad actor acting as president of your company, you can't use Reg D. Here's an interesting thing. Disqualifying events that don't happen in the, in the United States, in other words, they happen, I don't know, in Ukraine, don't count, or France. So if someone got convicted for securities fraud in France, went to jail for 20 years, and was mean to their mother, they can come to the U.S., and they're not a bad actor. Isn't that nice? So whatever you do outside the U.S. doesn't count, but still be good. Okay. Stock that's sold pursuant to a Reg D is, is restricted, meaning there's controls on resale, but there's ways around that too, or ways to handle it. Okay, now 506 breaks up in two categories. 506B is kind of the old version of Reg D. You only sell to accredited investors. You can't advertise it because then, of course, it would be a public offering. Right? Now, if you're trying to see whether or not someone is accredited, you can just ask them. You go, are you accredited? Hmm? Well, soon, right? Soon you'll have, are you accredited? Which means, do you have, do you earn more than $200,000 a year for the past two years? Okay, the answer, soon, soon, soon you will be, right? Okay, or do you have over a million dollars of net assets? Well, good, okay, with, with her fingers crossed, the answer was yes. Okay, what she just told me, and I believe you because I want your money, okay, that's called self-certifying. Okay, you certified to me, you told me it's true, unless I have a reason to not believe you, great, it's true, sign here. I didn't see that, I didn't see you cross your fingers. Okay, under 506C, it's a little bit different. You need to verify that someone's accredited. Miss, are you an accredited investor? You are. Uh, will you show me all the paperwork that proves that you're an accredited investor? Sure, okay, great, wow. There you go. I found my first verified accredited investor. I need to get all these documents. I need to prove to myself, reasonably prove, that she actually is telling the truth once she says she's accredited. In other words, verified as opposed to self-certifying. But if you use Rule 506C and you verify that everyone is accredited and you don't sell to unaccredited investors, there's something amazing that happens. You can do a general solicitation what does that mean? That means that you can advertise, let people know, put up a website about your private sale of securities, and the whole world can know about it. Wait, what? What? Huh? What? That makes no sense. Wait a second. Hold on. So under 4A2, remember, under the default rule is that you need to register any sale of securities. You have to get that approved by the SEC. You have to spend a billion dollars, and you're in trouble. Everyone's trying to avoid Section 5. There's an exception to, section, for, to uh, section 5 if you don't do a public offering. Okay, that's easy. We'll keep it private. But wait, under 506C, I can advertise to everyone and that's private? What? Wait, and I actually say here, wait, what? Okay, so for Section 4A2 on which 506 is based exempts non-public offerings. But under 506C, you can engage in public solicitation and can engage in public advertising. You can have a website offering these securities. Oh my God, what? Well, the, the idea is that even though you can advertise, I wouldn't say offer it to everyone, you can advertise it to everyone, you can let everyone know about it, but the, at, the, at the end, the only people who are allowed to actually buy this stuff are investors that you have verified. You're not trusting them. You're verified that they're accredited. 
which actually makes sense. If all these poor, uneducated, you know, innocent people, widows and orphans, if you advertise to them and they want to buy your stock but you don't let them buy it because they're not accredited and you check, then really they may be disappointed that they didn't get to buy your stock, but you didn't actually sell it to them so there's no harm. Okay, you didn't actually hurt anyone who's unaccredited. Okay, you didn't take advantage of anyone because you made sure that everyone is accredited. 506C is great. Okay, it lets you advertise and solicit everyone to sell your stock. You just need to make damn sure, and there's ways of doing this, uh, to make sure that they're accredited. Here's the, again, there's a long list and I'll give you the deck. But here's how you can check. You have them fill out an investor questionnaire where they explain why they're accredited. That's a good start, but it's not the end. You can look up their public records. You can look up their tax records. You can review their brokerage statements, their investment statements, their banking statements. You can have their accountant sign a letter. Okay, that's an easy, good one. Have their accountant sign a letter. This person made over a million, has over a million dollars of net assets. Okay, cool. And now there are certain third-party verification services. I think there's one called verifyinvestor.com um, that a guy started. There's several other ones also. You don't necessarily have to verify it yourself. You can hire someone else to verify it. And I think it's cheap. It's like $10 or $15 per investor. That's certainly worth it. Okay. Now, technically under 506C, you don't need to provide a written explanation of what you're selling. You don't need to provide disclosure documents. That's a really bad idea. Whatever the law is, the, Whenever you're selling securities, you, you should, as a matter of practice, provide a written document that explains everything about the company, everything about the investment, includes everything material, i.e. everything important, and doesn't leave anything out. And don't lie. Because the way the law works is if you disclose something, if you're not lying, the more you disclose, the less people can sue you for. If you tell the complete truth about something, then they have nothing to complain about because when they bought that security, they were on notice about the truth. So suppose you have a guy that committed securities fraud in France and went to jail for 20 years, and now he's in the U.S. Okay? You can still use uh, 506C because that happened outside the United States. You're still allowed to use it. But if you leave that out and you don't tell people about it, well, you're leaving out something very important that would probably affect their investment decision. You should include that information in the prospectus, in the information you're providing. It may scare some people away and probably should, but no one can sue you because you omitted the fact that your president was convicted of securities fraud. So you include all the truth, whether you're legally required to or not. Okay, again, final slide. Here's the punchlines. Do make rule, use of rule of Reg D. Reg D, remember, is the safe harbor that lets you know that offering is private or will be treated as private. And so you don't need to register it. Do make use of Reg D, specifically Rule 506C, not, not B, not anything else. Use Rule 506C to conduct a private placement and raise unlimited capital from an unlimited number of accredited investors. Do, do, verify Verify is the key word, that these investors are actually really accredited. Not that someone raised their fingers and crossed them, but that someone provided documents or you checked or you got a service to do it. Don't take their word for it. In other words, they may not self-certify. Okay? And just another way of putting that is don't mess around with unaccredited investors. They don't have any money anyway. Why would you bother? Don't. Check to see if the people you're working with, in other words, the covered persons, have had a disqualifying event because you don't want any bad actors. Someone who's gotten convicted for securities fraud, someone who's, being, who's under the jurisdiction of the SEC and has gotten an order, make sure you don't have any bad actors because you can lose your exemption if that happens. And finally, even if it's not always required, provide a written document explaining the investment. Include everything that's material, all the material facts, don't leave anything out and don't lie or misstate anything at all. Tell the truth and the complete truth. 
That's it. This is where you clap. Thanks. Um.